Good afternoon and welcome to another edition of Build Your AutoCAD IQ. This is a, another in the series of Build, uh, sorry, <laughs> Beyond the Basics, Working with Dynamic Blocks in AutoCAD 2017. Uh, I'm Victoria Studley and our presenter, our primary presenter today will be Sarah Emsley. We also have moderators, uh, Ashley Luz and Bryce Thalen joining us in the chat window. So ask them your questions and they'll try to help you out. So Sarah is a technical support specialist in Lake Oswego, Oregon. You might also see her uh, frequenting the Autodesk community page for AutoCAD. Uh, I am another Autodesk technical support specialist based out of our Manchester, New Hampshire office supporting different AutoCAD products. Uh, Ashley Luz is also a support specialist based out of Boston, Massachusetts. And Bryce Thalen is uh, also a technical support specialist supporting AutoCAD products out of our Lake Oswego, Oregon office. So before we get started, feel free to leave your questions in the chat window and we'll get to them as time allows. The session is being recorded and we'll upload it to YouTube uh, within a, a couple days here. And the links to the um, Sorry, the, the links to the uh, data set and the PowerPoint and script will be available in your registration reminder in the post-webinar survey, and we posted them in the chat window for you. Uh, we also want to remind you about a, uh, a cool day that we're hosting soon called Autodesk Answer Day. We did one of these last year, and uh, people were so interested in it that we've actually widened it to include a series of different uh, products. So if you're interested in learning things or asking questions about uh, 3ds Max, AutoCAD, Civil 3D, Inventor, Maya, Revit, or Vault, join us on May 18th. It's from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. Pacific or uh, 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. Uh, Eastern Time in the Autodesk community and search for Answer Days and you'll be able to find that or follow the link right here on the screen. If you need to find the link after the presentation, you can go ahead and download it. Uh, from the box site. So this is a, one of our Autodesk Help webinar series focused on AutoCAD. Uh, we'll have about 20 to 40 minutes of demo and some Q&A at the end. And uh, here are some, some of our upcoming topics. Uh, on May 12th, we'll be talking about lighting in AutoCAD 2017, part of our 3D series. On May 19th, we'll continue with some tips and tricks about external references. Uh, May 26th, you'll learn a little bit about basic blocks in AutoCAD as part of our Back to Basics series. And then on May 12th, we'll come back to our Beyond the Basics series and do another webinar about working with constraints in AutoCAD. Here are the links to the webinar playlist on YouTube as well as the data set. And then over here on the right, we have some links to the landing page if you want to refer a colleague or you need to re-register for the series, a link to our Autodesk community, and some information about joining the beta. So if you're interested in uh, having an influence on the upcoming versions of AutoCAD or AutoCAD LT, uh, email those addresses right there and you can get involved. Here are some more... Um, our, sorry, <laughs> here are some uh, links from our Autodesk Knowledge Network site. Autodesk Knowledge Network provides uh, help articles, troubleshooting, downloads, all the information you need to be productive with your software. Okay, so let's get down to the, uh, the topic for today. Today we'll be talking about dynamic blocks in AutoCAD. Uh, we'll go over the block editor, We'll talk about actions and parameters, and then if time allows, uh, we might get into block properties tables and visibility states. If we don't have time for those, um, we have a collection that we're trying out. There's a link that um, either Bryce or Ashley will put in the chat window for everybody, um, and you can visit that link, and we'll have a bunch of uh, resources for more information about dynamic blocks, as well as some screencasts about certain uh, features of dynamic blocks. And then we'll also post a link to the webinar there. So you have everything in one nice, neat place. So uh, let's, um, before we see this in AutoCAD, we'll run a couple of polls. 
the first thing we'd like to know is, is this your first Autodesk Help webinar? So go ahead and vote. We'll leave this open for a few seconds. For those of you who have been with us before, welcome back. And for those of you who are here for the first time, welcome. Glad to have you with us today. Thanks for taking an hour out of your day to learn something new. All right, I'll close the poll out and show you those results. It looks like we have a lot of new people today. Oh, sorry, no, I'm reading that wrong. <laughs> it looks like we have a few new people. And uh, most it's of you, Sarah most today. of your repeats. It is. Hi, Sarah. <laughs> All right, so we'll hide these and we'll do the second one here. And we'd like to know which AutoCAD-based application are you using in your day-to-day -day work? Are you in a full version of AutoCAD? Are you using AutoCAD LT? Are you in one of our vertical softwares like AutoCAD Architecture, MEP, Electrical, Mechanical, Plant? Uh, are you using one of the Civil 3D or MAP softwares? Or are you using something completely different? All right, so I'll close that one out and show you the results. Looks like most of you are actually in the full version of AutoCAD, followed by AutoCAD LT, and then a, almost an even split between the other verticals. And the last question before we get into the topics today. Oh. Ah, got it. Okay, we'd like to know, do you use dynamic blocks? So yes, all the time. Maybe you've dabbled in them a little bit and you've only used them occasionally. Maybe you've never touched them, but you're here because you want to learn how to use them. Um, if you have no idea what a dynamic block is, you're in for some really interesting stuff today. I'll leave that open for a couple of extra seconds here, and I'll close it out and share the results with you. It looks like some of you have, most of you have dabbled in them a little bit, but are interested in learning a little more. So hopefully we'll have some information that you can bring back to your day-to-day -day work to make you more productive in AutoCAD. Okay, so Sarah, do you want to show your screen real quick? Okay. I'll, um, let, let me, see. here, I'll give it, I'll give it over to you. Oh, okay. where did I go? And, yep, there we go. Okay, so once you get that up and running, I'll give us a quick, um, quick introduction to dynamic blocks, and then you can start in on the demo. There we go. Okay. Yep, we see your screen here. Let me just hide my control panel for the group meeting. Okay, are yep. you able to see my AutoCAD or is it just a clean screen? Before? I can see your AutoCAD, that's perfect. Gotcha. Yep. Okay. okay, I'll let you start with the intro. All right, so dynamic blocks in AutoCAD. Um, dynamic blocks are uh, blocks that you can add different um, different actions and parameters to, so that, uh, say, in, instead of, sorry, instead of having uh, seven different types of blocks for seven different types of chairs, you can have one type of chair in your drawing, one block, and then you can define different sizes, different uh, orientations to rotate them. You can define different geometry, different visibility states, so that they look a little bit different. Maybe they're a different size or different, uh, slightly different shape. Um, but you're still using the same block instance, so it makes them dynamic. Uh, so when you create dynamic blocks, you start by planning what you're going to put into your block content. You decide, you know, maybe I do have seven different types of chairs and I need to uh, define the geometry for all of those different pieces. So what you'll do is you draw that geometry out and then you'll add parameters to tell uh, AutoCAD how, you know, how far to move something or how to scale something uh, or which items to turn on and off. Uh, and then you'll add actions so that you can uh, manipulate the block to suit your needs as you're working in the drawing after you insert them. You can test the block uh, right in the block editor to make sure that it's working the way you want it to work. Uh, you can define some custom properties. Uh, maybe you have some different uh, grips or labels 
um, different values that you want to populate in the block every time you insert it. Um, maybe, maybe you have a certain chair that um, that is your default chair, but then you use the other ones sporadically. You might want to have one of those as the default visibility state or uh, default um, geometry that appears every time you insert that block. So you test the block and then you finish it. So today, uh, Sarah is going to show us how to create a dynamic door block using some of yeah. these features. I'm really excited yeah. to see this, Sarah, so I'm going to turn it over to you now. Okay, thank you. Welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Um, I'm actually going to show you my finished dynamic block first to get everyone excited. Uh, I went ahead and nicknamed my block LaFons. I hope we're okay with that. <laughs> As you can tell, it's resized kind of crazy here. And I have different impact areas that I set up with parameters and I set, set dimensions. So I'm going to go ahead and set my door down to a 3 by 8. And then I have another bit here where I can flip my door into the room. Let's actually move this down here. And then I have another impact zone where I can flip my door swing to look like that. That's my dynamic block. And then I also can show you my three different set dimensions that I have for my door. I wanted to show you the end product first. And then let's go ahead and move that out of the way so we can put in our new block that we are going to make. So I might run through this a little quickly. Um, we're going to set up our geometry first. And if I am running through it too quickly, I did make a screencast. And then we will have a script. So I, in my script, I have step by step of what I'm doing here. So I'm going to go ahead and make my door jams. And let me select my point. I'm going to go ahead and make my door jam one. Let's zoom into that. And I want to copy that. I'm going to go ahead and put my ortho on as well. Take it there. I'm going to give it three feet away. And then I need actually one more door jam for my door panel. So let's go ahead and butt up my door panel right up against my door jam. Oops. There we go. Let's get out of that. And then we're going to stretch my door panel to three feet. Let's put that there. And then I'm going to make a door swing. I chose start, center, end. I'm selecting door jam one. Then my door jam two, where it meets my door panel. And I'm going to end it at the top. OK. And let's go ahead and make a wipe out. So when we place our door on our wall, it will block out any line types or geometry that we're placing our door at. So let's go ahead and place our wipe out here. Oops. Rookie error I made there. Let's do that one more time. And let's hit enter. There we go. I'm going to go ahead and select my wipeout. I'm just going to give it a different color. Set it to blue. And then I'm going to draw order. I'm going to send that to the back. OK, so I have my geometry set. Now I'm going to go ahead and type in B for block. I'm going to name my block. I'm just going to name it door. Let's just say door underscore test. And then we want to specify our base point on the screen. We want to make sure that we check open in block editor. And then let's go ahead and select our geometry that we just made. Okay. And then we're going to say OK. And it should prompt me to ask for specify base point. So let's go ahead and select that hinge there. OK, and now we're in the block editor. So you're going to get your block authoring palette. I'm just going to dock my palette there. And then I need to pull up my properties palette. I'm going to dock that there. And you can change this however you want. I'm just going to leave it like this because it works for this demoing purposes. And we're going to add some parameters. So we're going to start with a linear parameter. 
And with this parameter, I want to stretch my wipeout and my door jam right here. So I'm going to go ahead and select my base point where my hinge is. I'm going to select my door jam. I'll just drag that parameter there. We can go ahead and change the default name. And I'm going to name mine for this parameter, door enter, and it, you can see that it changed. And I'm also going to go ahead and right click. And I only want one grip display for this door, and that's going to leave the impact zone right here by my door jam. So I set my parameter, and then now I need to add some actions. So I'm going to add a few. I'm going to start with a stretch action. You're going to want to select your parameter, and then the endpoint here, or like what I like to call it, my impact zone. And then once you select your endpoint, it should ask you to draw a stretch box, which I'm going to draw over the areas that I want to stretch. I'm going to select my wipeout, and I'm going to select my door jam. And hit enter, and then you can see I get that action icon right here. So when I stretch my wipeout and my door jam, I want to make sure that my door swing and my door panel stretches with it. So I'm going to add a couple more. I'm going to add a scale for my door swing. So again, I'm selecting my parameter. Then I'm selecting the arc. Enter, and then you'll see my scale icon is there. And then I need to do one more stretch for my door panel. So I'm going to go ahead and select my parameter. Endpoint here. Draw my stretch box. And then select my door panel. Hit enter, and then here we go. So if you hover over it, it gives you stretch or stretch one. You can rename this as well. So I'm just going to go ahead to further customize it and just name it stretch dash panel. And then I'll just do stretch DW for door width. All right. So now let's see how it looks in test block so far. Okay. So I'm going to select my block, if LaFonz wants to work with me. And OK, so you can tell, obviously, this looks crazy. And we need to go in and fix this and clean this up to make it look so that our door panel moves with our stretch. So let's get out of here, close our test block, and then we are going to go ahead and select our action stretch for our door panel, come over to our properties, box, our dialog box, and we are going to go to angle offset. And depending on what units you're drawing in, this is going to vary. But for me, a 90 angle offset is going to work. Let's test it to see. And it did. So we're in business right now. We're good. So let's go ahead and close out of our test block. And now let's set some predetermined dimensions, like how I showed you with my end product for my block. And this can be based off your company standards. I just made my own company standards according to Sarah. And I'm going to go ahead and show you how to make those dimensions. You're going to select your parameter. And we are going to come to our properties dialog box. We're going to go under value set. And then within distance type, we're going to select list, and then in distance value list, we're going to select this icon right here, that ellipses. And then here you can add your preset dimensions based on your company standards or like what I'm doing based on how I feel right now. So I'm going to set in a couple. Let's add just one more. And then if you think that you want to delete a couple later on, you can just come back in here and delete them however you want to add or delete. So I'm going to go ahead and say OK. And so you can see that that took effect by these uh, light blue tick marks here. So those preset dimensions that I have for my door width. So let's go ahead and test it to show you, make sure that I applied it, select my block, then you can see it gives me my 3866 or 30 or 36. So, so far, so good. 
let's close out of our test block. And then, hope everyone's still with me, we're going to add some flips. So we're going to want to add a flip to either have our door flip to the right or flip to the left and have it flip into the room and out of the room. So what we want to do first is set up a parameter for our flip. So I'm going to go to our parameter, set, select flip, and then my first flip, I'm going to have it either have my door swing to the right or to the left. And so I need to get a midpoint between my hinge where I put my base point and my door jam. So if you can't eyeball it, luckily I have this plus mark here, that could be my midpoint. But if you want to be sure, you just hold down shift on your keyboard and then right click on your mouse, select midpoint. So when I hover right there, you'll see that green triangle, that'll give me my midpoint. I'm going to select outside of the door and then I'm going to put my text down here for my flip parameter. And then I'm going to change that default name so that I don't get confused to flip door right slash left. All right, so now that we set up our parameter, we need to add an action. So we're going to come back over to our palette here and select our flip action. And I'm going to select my new parameter that I just made. So I'm going to select my flip door parameter. And then I just want my door panel and I want my door swing to be a part of this flip action. I'm going to hit enter. And then as you can see, my action icon drops down by my impact zone for my flip. So I have that here. And now that I have my door panel and my door swing flipping either right or left, I want to associate what I did previously to this flip icon. So what I'm going to do now is that I'm going to go ahead and select my flip icon. I am going to right click go to action selection set and then we're going to do new selection set and then it's going to ask me for me to select my objects and actually I want all of this so I'm going to go ahead and type in all and hit enter one more time and then let's test it and see if that worked it should be better LaFon's she was getting crazy with me earlier when I was trying to practice make sure. But she's going to be working, and she does. So there we go. We can flip it to the left. We can flip it to the right. And then we can also stretch. And our preset dimensions that we had are still there. So we're in business. We're good. That's so awesome. Let's close. Good job, LaFon. Yeah, let's close out of that. She was getting crazy with me earlier. She wasn't, <laughs> she wasn't cooperating, but she is right now. So that's good. <laughs> So it's working, everything is associated, my flip command to my action commands that I, my actions and my parameters that I made previously. So let's go ahead and assign our midpoint to actually move um, when we stretch our door. So I am going to need to come in to my actions on my palette and select move. And I am going to go ahead and select my original parameter because I want this I want my midpoint to stay with me no matter how far I stretch it. So I'm going to select my original parameter, then I'm going to select my endpoint here, and then it's going to ask me to select objects, and then I'm just going to go ahead and make sure that I select my flip parameter. So I want my flip parameter to be associated to my midpoint and my new my original parameter. So I'm so I, again, I'm sorry if that was confusing. It was, I selected the move action, selected my parameter, selected my endpoint, and now I'm selecting my flip parameter. I'm going to hit enter. Let's test that out one more time to see if that worked how I wanted it to. Let's select our block, stretch it out a little bit. Let's go back. Okay, I think we're in business. Good. Actually, we are not. That did not look. Let me look at it one more time. Yeah, that was not right because that looks a little crazy right there. 
So let's go back and close my test block. Let's select our move icon, and we actually need to add a distance multiplier, and that's at a um, 1.0, 1 .1 but I want it at a 0.5. So I'm going to hit Enter, and then let's test that one more time. Okay, let's select our block. That looks so much better. That's what we want. Okay, good. So after you go ahead and set your move action, you want to make sure that you don't forget this step like I did for distance multiplier. And again, this is going to change depending on what units you're in, but for me, 0.5 works. And again, we'll have this data set and the script and this recording up for you to review later on at your own pace if this is a too fast of a pace. So we set our flip, uh, flip parameter and our move. And now I want to make sure that my base point moves with my door panel when I flip my door right or left. So I'm going to just escape. I'm going to go to my parameters, select my base point, and I'm just going to select this hinge where I had it originally. And now it's asking me to specify a parameter location. So I'm just going to go ahead and select the same spot that I selected my base point. I'm going to hit Enter. All right. And then let's go ahead and associate my new base point with my flip. I hope you guys are staying with me. My flip, my flip parameter so that when I flip my door right or left and I stretch it, my base point moves as well. So I'm going to select my flip action, right click, action selection set, and then we're going to do actually a new. And I'm going to go ahead and just say all because I want everything to flip. Hit enter again, and then let's test this. OK. And then let's try to flip it this way. There's our base point. So, so far, so good. We're able to stretch. OK, we're good. So let's close out of this. And now that we have that, our last, our couple last steps, we're going to add a flip parameter and a flip action so that our door either flips into the room or out of the room. So let's go back to our parameters. We want to set a flip. And so for our door to flip in or out of the room, I need to set my flip parameter. Um, horizontally. So let me just turn off my O snap for this. And I need the midpoint between my two door gems. So I'm going to hold down that shift on my keyboard again. I'm going to right click, select midpoint, and then that should be it. Click right there. And then I'm going to click my second door gem. And then I'm going to go ahead and just select my text to say there. Okay. And let's go ahead and change that name. To flip door in slash out enter. Okay, we have our new name and then we have our impact blue arrow right here. So we have our new parameter and like we've done previously, once we set our parameter, we add our actions. So we're going to come to our actions. We're going to select our flip action. We're going to go ahead and select our new flip parameter and then it's going to ask us for our select our objects and then we want to say that we want all of our objects to flip in and out of the room. Enter again and then we need to test our block. Let's test our block. Let's make sure Everything's good. So let's flip our door this way. Let's see if we can resize it to 3, 8. OK, our base point moved. Let's flip the door inwards, and our base point moved again. Let's see if we can stretch our door a little bit further to our other set dimension. All right, and then let's just make a full circle out of this. and. Stretch it back down to 3 0, and then flip into the room. 
And there we go. Our dynamic door block. So let's get out of the test. And then let's go out and close our block editor. Let's save our changes. Let's see this bad boy in action. So we're going to go ahead. We're going to flip our door into the room. Let's move it down. Turn my O snap back on. Maybe my ortho off. Give me some free space to roam. I'm going to select it there. And then just a demo and make my door look crazy, I'm going to go ahead and select it at 6.6. Six. So there we go. There's your dynamic door. And I think this would be extremely beneficial for those of you who are working on a ton of different drawings and you have set blocks that you need to apply to different projects. And you can take this with you and pass it on to your colleagues or clients. And I think it would save you a good amount of time, especially having that preset. Blocks are awesome, but I think dynamic blocks just take it up a notch. And I hope you enjoyed the demo. And again, if I went too fast, the script will be made available along with I made a separate screencast for you guys. So thank you for sticking with me. I hope that wasn't too much. That was great, Sarah. Thanks. Um, okay. Before before you turn it over to me, um, I one thing that I noticed that you, you really did that um, I want to highlight is that as you added parameters and actions, the blocks started to get really complicated. And you made sure to yes. name all of those parameters. And that can yes. be so important because these get complicated very quickly. And if somebody else yes. goes to modify your block, having those things labeled saves you a lot of time. So flip yes. door in and out, like describe exactly what that parameter does. It's really important if you're sharing these blocks with other people. Um, and then you, sometimes with you work too, automatics. you go so fast, you forget, yeah, you forget what's going on. It's like, okay, wait, I think this one is meant to do this. Yeah. So yeah, exactly. Um, so we, we do have a couple of, um, we have a, a lot of industry pros. You guys are, uh, you guys are definitely um, the, the industry pros when it comes to AutoCAD. Uh, there were a couple of comments about um, where the door swing and where the door leaf are, are located. And um, so you can, you can change these to suit your needs. I know that sometimes we, uh, we draw a little bit inaccurately, but it's, um, you get the basic idea. We're just showing you the principles yes. here. So I just wanted to address that. We had a couple of... Uh, couple of questions about where the, the door jam should be and all that. So, Oh, yes, yes. yes. I'm still yeah. a learning, growing yeah, child yeah. of AutoCAD. So please, any, <laughs> any criticism, good or bad, I'll take it as constructive. So <laughs> it's much very, very much welcome. I just want to show you the cool perks of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You guys can take this block afterwards and, and make the modifications and use it, yeah. use it if you want. You can just take this one and recycle it if you feel like it. We'll provide it to you, and you can, you can tweak it to your own needs. You can amp it up to sure. this awesome block and please share it back with me because I'd love to learn a couple new tricks too. Yeah. And then I do see one about, um, I know we didn't prepare for this, but the uh, you can change the angles of the doors. Um, we just didn't yes. have time to prepare that for this particular presentation. Um, but maybe we can create a screencast about how to do that afterwards and share that out okay. with you guys. Um, check that collections page. That's uh, The link is in the chat window there. As we'll add to that after the presentation to show you a couple of tips and tricks. Yeah, that'd be awesome. I'd be happy to do that for, for everyone. Yeah, that would be super cool. All right, um, I will take over the presentation from here. Uh, let me see if I can transfer it to me. I'm going to share my screen. Oh, where's my AutoCAD? Just let me know when you can see. I can see yours, Victoria. I can see your screen. Excellent. All right. And is AutoCAD full size? Yep. Excellent. Perfect. All right. Yes. Okay. So for the next portion here, uh, I'm going to demonstrate a couple of other features within the dynamic block editor. Uh, dynamic blocks are so uh, they're so complicated, and there are so many cool things that you can do with them that we really can only focus on a few things at a time um, in a in a given hour. So the two things that I want to touch on right now are uh, we're going to start with a block properties table. And then 
just quickly demonstrate what you can do with visibility states. So to start here, um, I have what looks like a, a general office layout. And so we have some offices of different sizes, but they have some pretty standard furniture in them. And those furniture pieces are drawn over and over again. But if you have, um, let's say you do hotel work or condos or things with repetitive plans, you might not want to draw that over and over again because that plan might change. And maybe, you know, 6,000 and 6,001 are the exact same layout. They're just mirrored. Um, and the same with 6002 and 6003 and so on. You might want to leave these blank just so that the plan looks clear um, or uh, so that you don't have to do a lot of repetitive work. So I could come in here and um, so I have these blocks for the labels for these rooms. And this one uh, is just a regular block with an attribute in it. And I could come in and change this attribute to whatever I want it to be um, and it'll change. Um, however, I'd have to go in and do this for every single block, and then I'd also have to come in and change the text if somebody moved um, from one office to another. And maybe I want to add some information here. Uh, so down here, I have another version of this same plan, except I've only drawn each one of the units once. And we're going to create a block that can quickly um, populate the information for each particular unit. So the first thing that I want to do is draw my rectangle for my, I'm just going to copy this one. Yeah, there we go. And then I'm going to move this down so it's close to zero, zero. That's my old block. Okay, so I've got this close. And I'm just going to pop it onto the room number layer. And from here, I'm just going to go right in, use the block command, and we'll just call this uh, room info. We'll call it room info block. I'm going to pick my base point and then open in block editor is checked. And this will open the block editor for me. Now once we're in the block editor, I've got my block authoring palette. I also have my properties available. Um, I don't remember if Sarah covered this, but if you don't have anything selected, and you go into properties, you can change some of these block properties. Um, so right in here are the units, um, whether or not you allow exploding, whether it scales uniformly, whether it's annotative. So you come in here and familiarize yourself with some of these um, different properties of the entire block uh, because they, they are uh, useful tools. So on to um, onto our block properties table though. So from here, um, what I'm going to do is add a couple of attribute definitions. The first one I'm going to add is the, we'll just call this um, unit number. Oh, here we go, unit number. And our default will be, I'm gonna make it X. That way I know that if I see a block that I've inserted by default and it has X's, then I haven't filled out the information for that. I haven't chosen which unit this is yet. I'm going to make this eight inches. And standard textile, my justification, I want to be middle center. So I'm going to change that. And I want to lock the position of this attribute. And then from here, I can come in and find the center. Let's find the intersection of those two midpoints. And now I have my unit number. Um, I'll put it on to you know, uh, normally I would put these on the layers, but I just want to get the information out there for you. So you could come in and put these on the right layers later if you want to. Um, for now, I'm just going to open up another attribute definition and we'll say uh, employee name. And we want to be prompted with the word employee. And then our default, again, is going to be a series of X's. Left justification is fine. I'm going to make this a little bit smaller. Uh, let's make this one four. And then I want to unlock the position of this one because maybe I want to move the name around independently of the rest of the block. So I'll just pop that up there. Let's make another one. And for this one, what was I going to do? Um, orientation. So the orientation, um, I want 
to define as either per plan or reverse. You might see reverse, you might see mirror. Um, this will come in handy with those uh, mirrored plans later. So I'll leave this as left justification. I want to make this six inches. I'm going to lock the position of this one too because I want it to be lined up directly underneath this one. Okay. And then from here, oh, that not, that didn't take, there we go. Oh, that one doesn't like me. All right, I'm going to go in and do it again. Sorry about that awkward moment. <laughs> We're a little familiar with those around here. Oh, I know what happened. I didn't set a default. Oh no, I did. I did set a default. I said per plan. All right, let's see what happens if I put this one in now. Hmm. Okay, that one doesn't like me. Uh. I'm going to try one more, and if this doesn't work, then we'll move on. Uh, we'll call this one unit type. And maybe my default unit type, maybe I have predominantly, you know, unit A. Okay. And we'll leave this one here. Okay. All right, it liked me there. So we'll put this one down here. <laughs> Try that orientation one one more time. If it doesn't work, then I'm going to move on. Okay. Maybe it needs that. Okay, got it. I don't know why it's being so finicky with me today. That's it's, why I named mine. She was being crazy with me earlier. Oh, okay. All right. uh, <laughs> some Al, days Albert. it works, some days yeah, Albert, there you go. Yep. Perfect. I'll name this one Albert. Now it'll be <laughs> all right. Cool. Okay, so from here, now I have my attributes defined and I have my geometry in the file. Um, what I'm going to do from here is, um, okay, so over here, we have on the actions palette the block properties table and if I click block properties it's going to prompt me uh, to place the location of this uh, block properties table and I'm going to place it off to the left hand side I wonder if it's my mouse okay so from here it's going to prompt me for uh, the number of grips, either zero or one, I'm going to just accept the default and say one grip. So from here, we can populate this table with all of these attributes and make a quick little drop down list um, so that we know if we have a certain unit number that all of the other information should be populated based on this table. So I'll click on the function icon to add those properties. I'm going to shift and click on all of them and click OK and you'll notice that now they appear in the table and now all we have to do is fill it out so let's say 6000, 6001, 6002, 6003, 6004 all the way down to 6007 oh. and then I can fill in who we have, we have Sarah, we have Ashley, we have Bryce, we have me, Volker, and, oh. We have Zach, we have Mike, and we have Noman. All right. And then the unit type, we know this one's, you know, unit A, and this one's unit A as well. But we know that this one up here, is per plan and then we know this one is the reverse and then we can go down the list and just say unit B unit C and unit D 
filling this out is probably the most time consuming part of making this block, but it's really not that bad. You can actually, if you have repetitive data, use your control C, control V to copy paste, and it goes pretty quickly from there, as long as you select the right cell. There we go. Got it. Okay. So now I'm going to click OK. I've got my block properties table filled out. If I need to come back into the block properties table for some reason, just double click on it and you can modify the data. Uh, you can also lock it so that the properties that you select have to match a row in the table. Um, I tend to leave this one unchecked because sometimes you, you know, maybe just want to override it really quickly. Maybe you have somebody or, or maybe you have a piece of information that just needs to be in this one unit and it happens to defy the table. That can be useful. But feel free to lock it down too if you really need to. So now that we've got this defined, I'm going to... Yeah, we have time for this. Okay. I'm just going to put these on the right layers. It's driving me crazy. I'll put this on the employee layer. I'll put this on the room number. And then this one we'll also put on room number. Okay, so from here, uh, if you ever do lose the, um, the ribbon, the block editor ribbon, all of your other tools in AutoCAD are available within the block editor, but then the block editor contextual ribbon appears up on the right and it's highlighted. Um, so just look at the top, look to your top right and you'll see that contextual ribbon to get back to the uh, block editor tools themselves. Okay, so from here, I just want to test my block, and I'll select it, and we see my block lookup table here, and if I click on 6000, you'll see all of this information populate. I don't know if you can see that, it's highlighted funny against the gray. I'll do one more, and then we'll insert it in the file and see how it works. So I like it, it's populating correctly. I'm going to close the test block. Oh, there we go. And then close the block editor. I'm going to save the changes to my room info block. And then from here, you'll notice this hasn't updated, but when I insert a new room info block, I'm not going to explode it. I'm going to specify the insertion point on the screen. I'm going to insert it over here, like so. And then it's going to prompt me for some information, but I'm going to leave it blank for now. I'm just going to accept the defaults and then copy this around. We'll copy this one up to here. And then we'll grab these two and we'll copy them over to here and here and there. And then from here, I'm going to, I'll zoom in so you guys can see this really clearly select 2000, or sorry, 6000. This one up here I know is number 6001. And you'll notice that 6000 and 6001 are the same unit, but this one's reversed. So we know that it's a mirrored plan of this one. We don't even have to draw any of the information in there. And then over here, so I'm not crazy about Sarah's name here overlapping the wall. I can move this uh, attribute independently. So maybe I want it to appear up here. Uh, maybe I can pull Ashley's in over here. And the same thing goes for all of these. You can just populate them really quickly, 6002, and then 3, and 4, and so on. So I'll just finish these out, and I will save this file so that you guys can have it and play around with it. You can change your textiles. You can make it fit your company standards if you want. But there they are. Cool stuff. I think that's awesome. Yeah, I like that one. That was, uh, that was kind of a fun one. Um, yeah. The last thing I have, I see we have about 10 minutes. I can do this one really mm -hmm. quickly. Um, so another good use of dynamic blocks is for title blocks. I see people do this differently all the time. Um, you can find all sorts of cool uses for dynamic blocks in your title blocks, from resizing it so that it's from, you know, 8.5 by 11 to 11 by 17 to C size to D size. Um, you can use the same title block for all of this if you uh, do it right in the block editor. One of the things that I want to illustrate here is that, see, I've used the same theory here with the block lookup table, or sorry, the block properties table. 
and you can just select the project title and it populates all of the designer and um, check by information. So one of the things I want to show you is uh, sometimes you'll do construction sets and you want to make sure that you're marking those sets with a not for construction um, uh, piece of text that plots across it so that when you send it out it, it appears on all of your sheets. So you might want to incorporate that into your title block but maybe you don't want it to appear on all of your pages or maybe you don't want it to appear all the time. So I'm going to take this one, I've right clicked on it, I'm going to open up the block editor and from here, I'm going to add some text. So just the regular mtext command. And define my area. And then I'm going to type in not for construction. And I'm going to make this huge. So I'll come up here. Maybe we want this to be six inches. Maybe that's a little too big. <laughs> got a little got a little overzealous there. Uh, let's try three. Uh, Two, one, one might be good. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so that looks good. I'm just going to open this up. And I'm going to rotate it. So that it comes all the way across here. And then what I want to do is add a, vi a visibility state. Now, visibility states allow you to pick uh, different objects that appear um, depending on which state you have selected. There's a zero visibility state by default, um, but as soon as you add a visibility parameter, so on my block authoring palettes, it's under the parameters um, uh, tab. You can click on visibility, and let's say I just want to put it over here on the right-hand side. Now I have this visibility uh, parameter here. Um, instead of adding an action, what this does is as soon as the parameter is added, it, um, I don't know if you noticed, here I'll, I'll delete this again, the visibility states, um, the visibility panel is grayed out until you add that parameter. So I'll add the parameter in again, and there it is. So now this becomes available. I can click on the visibility states manager, and it opens up this dialog box and allows you to add new visibility states. So what I'm going to do is click New. Visibility states 1 is fine. Maybe you want to name it not for construction. Construction. Okay. And then you have a couple of options here. You can hide all of the existing objects that have been drawn so far when you uh, open this new visibility state. Or you can show all of the existing objects in that new state. Or you can leave the invis the sorry leave the visibility of existing objects unchanged, and then choose as you draw things um, whether or not to include them. I'm just going to leave the default here, um, and then say OK. So now that I have this not for construction visibility state, um, what I want to do is flip back to this zero state, and I'll select my not for construction uh, text. And up here, there are three different options. Um, there's this, this one will just show you, it toggles off, it's BV, BV mode will tell you whether or not things that are invisible are slightly visible but grayed out or not. Um, I'll demonstrate that in a minute. Uh, the second thing is to make things visible in the current visibility state. The third thing is to make them invisible in the current visibility state. So what I've done here is I've selected the zero visibility state and I just want to make this invisible. So now when I switch over to not for construction, it's visible by default and I've turned it off in this zero visibility state. Um, here I'll show you what the visibility mode does. You can change this with the command uh, BV mode, but you can also use the little toggle up here in the, in the uh, ribbon. So BV mode. See it just grays it out and then if I switch between them, I can still see what's invisible. It's just uh, grayed out there. So I'm going to close the block editor, show you how this works, and then we'll wrap up. So if I click this, there's my visibility state here. So it shows up there. I can click on it, 
and I see my two visibility states in the drop down. I select not for construction and there's my text. And then I can easily select it and go back to the zero visibility state and it disappears. So I will save this out and let's go back here. Okay, so here are some additional resources that you guys can use. Um, we've got a previous webinar about dynamic blocks. We've got some screencasts. We've got that down the bottom. I would pay particular attention to that collection. Um, that should be useful because we'll consolidate all of these resources into one place for you to make it a little bit easier to find. Um, if you find me on, um, on AKN, uh, it shows up under my collections as well if you're looking for it. So thanks for joining us today. Uh, if you have more questions or feedback after the webinar, you can feel free to post them in the community for us, or you can email us directly at autodesk.help.webinars at autodesk.com. Make sure that you put Build Your AutoCAD IQ subject in the subject line because there are other webinar series, and uh, it's good to know which series you're asking your question about or providing feedback for. Thank you, guys. All right. There's a, do we have time for Q&A? I think we have four minutes left. If, okay. you, if you want to try to enter any of me. Do we have any good, uh, quick questions in the uh, chat window? Ashley, Bryce, anybody? I think we're okay on questions, Victoria. Oh, let's see. I yep. have one where uh, I'll just ask this one, and I think we have enough time just for one, but it's can you import table content from blocks? Oh, as in, um, actually, yeah, that's a cool thing to show. Uh, if I understand the question correctly, you can extract data from these. Um, if you type in the data extraction command, so this would be a good thing to show. This is really useful. Um, so we're just going to create a new extraction and I'll save it to my desktop and just say test and I just want to get through to where we're going. Uh, let me just select the objects. Let's, we'll just select two of these blocks for, for an example and then I'll go to next. Now these all show up in a table here. Um, you can choose which information to keep and which Im information not to keep. Um, all of the attributes should show up. And then you can decide what you do and don't want. Um, I just want the attributes. And then we'll click next. And next. And then this is what I want to show you here. You can insert a data extraction table into the drawing. You can output it to Excel too if you want to. Um, but I find this one particularly useful. You can set it to your own table style add headers and all that. And then once you finish, it'll prompt you to insert your table. And then you have a nice neat table. Cool. Um, awesome. if, I, if I named my dynamic block a little more logically, then it might show up as like, you know, unit, unit tags or something. Um, you can hide different cells and stuff. Like if I don't want these polylines in there, um, I can get rid of those, but it'll show you all of the, it'll, it'll, quickly create a nice little uh, table for you with all that block data in it. Okay, perfect. I think we hit the mark at 11.59 to give back everyone some time with 30 seconds. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that sounds good. Let's wrap it up here. If you guys have more questions afterwards, feel free to reach out to us and we'll, uh, we'll do our best to get back to you. Thanks for joining us again and hopefully we'll see you next week.